Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me and for uh, turning up in huge numbers. The last time I was in Lund to give a talk at this university was before most of you were born. <laughs> 1969. <laughs> when I was much younger. And I gave a talk on the uprising student worker uprising in Pakistan that it, uh, was in process uh, at the time and many many people and questions were discussed and that problem in Pakistan of course continues over 44 decades later. But what I want to do tonight is talk really about two things. Uh, wars which carry on in this world even more so than during the period of the Cold War when communism was considered the main enemy, when actually European countries participated in very few wars at all, despite being supporters of the United States, despite being members of NATO, not a single Western European country sent troops to fight in Vietnam. Uh, and today, barely is a war declared when the Euro leaders of Europe put their hands up and say, yes, please, count us in too, in whatever way we can. And it's important to discuss this, because this is the situation that has existed now for the last 10 to 12 years, particularly after 9-11, but even before that, this was the direction in which things were moving. And the excuse which was largely given especially after the events of 9-11, 10 years ago, was that the Muslim world is troubled, uh, that the Muslims aren't interested in democracy, that they are perfectly happy to be ruled and governed by dictators, and that in this situation the United States has to intervene from time to time uh, in order to keep the situation stable. Well, many of us, not me alone, many of us, including many American intellectuals, attacked this point of view and said this was a wrong way of looking at it. And I argued in the first book I wrote uh, in response to Samuel Huntington's The Clash of Civilizations that this was not a clash of civilizations, this was a clash of fundamentalisms. Religious fundamentalism as represented by Al-Qaeda, and political imperial fund fundamentalism as represented by the United States. And that therefore this war had absolutely nothing to do with Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or minor religions. That this was essentially something deeply political that was uh, going on. And the other point I made, that far from being hostile, the bulk of Muslims who lived in Muslim countries were desperate for the chance to get rid of their governments democratically. It was not the case that they weren't interested in democracy. And whenever permitted by dictators in the two largest countries, Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world, and Pakistan, ruled largely by military dictators, that whenever they were given a chance to vote, they came out in large numbers and they voted. And they voted largely for secular parties and moderate parties. They didn't vote for extreme religious groups. And that if the Arab world was given a chance, they would vote too for parties of their choice. But in countries which produce a large amount of oil, democracy is not being considered a useful attribute as far as the United States and the West is concerned. Because a truly democratic government, whenever it comes up and however it comes up, wants to use the oil for its own people. And this goes a long way back. Iran, which everyone talks about now, is a huge danger and a threat. We'll come to that in a minute. But when Iran produced a democratic government in 1953, he, as a result of a huge nationalist campaign, and its leader, 
Muhammad Musadda came to power, the first thing they did was to nationalize Anglo-American oil, largely dominated by the British. They nationalized it, and the government was toppled. And the toppling of that government was done with the help of the mosque. And that transformed Iran's history. The Shah, who had fled the country, a very despotic ruler, came back with Western backing, built a strong despotic regime, and the only places where you were allowed to talk politics or anything were the mosques. Political parties were banned, a huge torture machine was established, and the mosques became the only place where you could go in and out. So why were people surprised when the mosques became the organizing center for the movement to get rid of the Shah? And the movement was then taken over by clerics. So history, it's extremely important to understand what history is and to learn from this history. And as a, in parenthesis, I would say to all of you who are students that we live in an age where we are not encouraged to learn history. History is increasingly in schools and universities taught in tiny modules. Books are not read. A historical narrative which explains something is absent. Some things are discussed endlessly like the Second World War. Other things are not discussed at all. And certainly in Britain today, on British campuses, in some universities, the history departments have been closed down. And in one huge university, the University of Sussex, they are not going to teach pre-20th century history, which is crazy. Because the result of this is that you produce people, graduates, who are only partially educated and aren't encouraged to learn what has happened. You cannot understand the origins of the First World War just in the 20th century. They go way back to the formation of European empires and what these empires did, the rivalry between the empires, the fight for more space by the Germans, even under the Kaiser. Cannot understand these things unless you understand history, and it's the same in the Arab world. Now, Interestingly enough, in the Arab world, ordinary people, including people who've barely been to school, the one thing they do understand and have knowledge of is their history. They know it. They will go back to the Crusades. They will tell you in Damascus in a cafe that when the French marched in, and took the city after the First World War with the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, the French General Bureau marched to the grave of the historic king of that world, the Sultan Saladin, who had defeated the Crusaders and made Jerusalem a city for all the three religions again. That The French General marched to his tomb near the Grand Mosque and said, Saladin, we are back. The cross has triumphed over the crescent. This is how many centuries afterwards. So people in the Arab world understand what their history is and the importance of it. And that gives them an understanding also of their rulers today and who they are and what they do. And within that context, one has to understand the Arab uprisings as a desperate bid by the new generations and the old to try and win mastery over their own countries. <coughs> because what happened during the Cold War essentially and after the Cold War ended is a particular type of ruler came to power with the backing of the West and was kept in power, regardless of all else, because they served the needs of the West. So Hosni Mubarak, who has done everything that any normal human being would be critical of, 
torture, rape of prisoners, large-scale corruption, hereditary politics, preparing his son to succeed him, and all this with the backing of the West. His creepy son, when he used to go to the United States and was interviewed on CNN, used to be introduced as, and this is Gamal Mubarak, very likely to be the next president of Egypt. No longer. And the reason they hesitated before agreeing that Mubarak had to go in Washington was because he was close. Hillary Clinton said, why Bill and I regard him as family? I bet they did. <laughs> and so did many of the European leaders. So when the uprising started in Tunisia, if you look at it now, we, have, we are some months away from the Arab Spring. And we can have a, a, a first balance sheet that the amazing thing about this is the speed with which it spread from one country to the other. <coughs> and the origins of it are Tunisia. But this is a country regarded generally as a country of lotus eaters, people who love their pleasures, very soft-spoken, very mild people. <coughs> and when these people rose against their rulers and toppled him, Ben Ali, the mood in Egypt became electric. People said, if the Tunisians can do it, what are we waiting for? The, the, the impact of Tunisia was huge. And the French president, Sarkozy, understanding that, didn't want Ben Ali, the dictator, to quit. And a secret message was sent to him by the French defense minister, saying, hang on in there. We're ready to dispatch French paratroopers who will keep you in power. Don't surrender to the mobs. But it was too late. By that time, the situation was out of control, and Ben Ali was already on a plane to Saudi Arabia, which is usually the final resting place of these people. <laughs> and then it started in Egypt. And it went on and on and on. And young people in Egypt, your generation, were incredibly courageous. And in these movements, a crucial point is reached when the people in power know that repression isn't going to work and that if they carry on with the repression, they could split their own armed forces. That is always a critical moment. That when within the armed forces, Soldiers say we're not going to open fire on our people and tell their officers, if you order us to fire and kill our own people, we're not going to do it. That is a crucial point in time. And in Egypt, that point was reached. Hundreds of people died, not talked about that much. Hundreds of people died. That was another crucial turning point, that that didn't stop it. They thought, Mubarak thought it would. But when a people in motion lose their fear of death, which is the most important fear in any human being's life, when you lose the fear of death, then you can achieve political miracles. That has been the history of all successful uprisings and revolutions. And they lost their fear of death in Tunisia. Or rather, one person, a poor stallholder, burning himself, showing that he had lost his fear of death, triggered an entire country to rise in arms in solidarity with him. And in Egypt, they killed, they tortured, they picked up people, they, the Mubarak security forces raped women in Terry Square. There were inspections of virginity. Are you a virgin coming into the square? Despite this, the crops carried on turning out. In Alexandria, the city was in the hands of the population for 24 hours before some troops arrived to take control. It wasn't just Eri Square in Cairo, it was the whole of Egypt. So Mubarak had to go. And he went, humiliated, despised, leaving behind the dregs of his regime, which are still there, by the way. It's not all over. 
the military has just reimposed a state of emergency because people said the Israeli ambassador should be sent home. We don't like the treaty with Israel, which was the big concern of the United States. Will the new government break the treaty? Well, the military doesn't want to because it gets billions a year from the United States, but the population is not in favor of it. Unless the Palestine issue is settled. The, popul the Egyptian population always hated that treaty. Now they can say so. And the minute they say so the first time, the state of emergency is reimposed. So in Egypt, we have a continuous situation which has not yet been resolved. And its resolution is not simply dependent on what happens in Egypt, but elsewhere. Then we have in Syria, yet another despot, clinging on to power, refusing to go, murdering his own people, and the people in Syria, some of the leaders of the movement, the popular movement in Syria, I know, I have met them in trips to Damascus and, and Beirut over the years. Incredibly courageous people. One of them was kept in prison for about 20 years, tortured, refused to break. They wanted to break him. He told me that. He said all they wanted me to say was, I have broken, I'm prepared to collaborate with you, and I would have been given all sorts of perks and government positions. He refused to do it. He was a doctor. He refused to do it. And he described to me once performing an operation in a Syrian prison on an Islamist prisoner who appendix burst. And he described how he operated with him, operated on him, with simple implements, knives and forks, got there, uh, uh, burnt to uh, get rid of all impurities, and succeeded in saving his life. And as a result was worshipped by all the prisoners who've never seen this happen before. There are people like that in that world. And these are people who are in the leadership of the Syrian movement. And they said two things when I spoke with them early on. They said, we don't want any Western intervention, no military intervention. We've seen what they did in Iraq. And this was before the intervention in Libya. They said, we've seen what they did in Iraq. We'll get rid of this so-and-so ourselves. And the second thing they said, and we are trying to do it peacefully. There have been many provocations, and we haven't fought. We haven't hit back with weapons, which we could. But how long can they carry on like this? Because the, ma the mobilizations have been huge, absolutely huge. But they've been thrown back because the two things, the big difference with Egypt. First, the army remains under the control of the regime. Even on lower levels, it hasn't split. More importantly, and this one has to understand, and it's regrettable, but it's true that the Syrian merchant trading bourgeoisie, which is very dominant in that country, still continues to back the regime. In Egypt and in Yemen, they broke, absolutely broke. So the regime still has a base of support in the bazaar, if you like, and the rich, and the traders. And so it's how this conflict will end, in all honesty, I do not know. Perhaps we will suffer a huge defeat in Syria. They were, I don't want to even say this, but because the people there are convinced that they're going to win. Uh, then you look at Yemen, a country described as rife with Al-Qaeda terrorists. When I visited Yemen a couple of years ago, Soon after some Japanese tourists visiting a very beautiful part of the southern south of Yemen, Hadramu, uh, were killed. And I went to Yemen, invited by Yemenese uh, architects and people to just see the country officially. That was the cause, the reason for my going. But of course I wanted to see what was going on politically. And the first thing I wanted to find out was, what was the strength of Al-Qaeda, or did they even exist in the Yemen? And I asked a former prime minister of the Yemen, who I had an interview with, 
I said, let's be honest now, you know what, how, how many Al-Qaeda people are there? And at first he said, <coughs> so I said, what does it mean? 200, 300? He said, at the maximum. So I said, 200, 300 is nothing. What is all the fuss about? And the fuss is about getting money from the United States. So you build up, say there's this threat, the Americans pour in, American technicians come in, the CIA builds centers in southern Yemen, and they say we're fighting Al-Qaeda. I then actually went to the town opposite which the Japanese tourists had been killed. And I asked quite a few dignitaries in that town, who killed them? They said, no one from our town. I can, we can vouch for that. No one from our town killed them. We don't behave like that. So I said, the government is saying it was Al-Qaeda terrorists. And they said, we, you know, they didn't want to talk because they're scared. People are picked up and tortured all the time. Finally, a guy came to me and whispered in my ear. He said, shall I tell you where Al-Qaeda are? I said, yeah. He said, they're all in an office just next to that of the president. The meaning being that this is a government provocation, that they're using this to win Western support. And that is a common view. Because in the south of Yemen, there is a popular revolt against the regime in the north. People feel they made a big mistake in agreeing to unify with the north. The south is more advanced, better educated, etc., etc. And they feel that now they're being crushed. So every time the despots Effigies are burnt in a village, they say Al-Qaeda. A newspaper attacked in uh, Aden, because it was the only critical newspaper in the country. The government military surrounded it and fired on it. And the plan was to wipe them all out. They didn't succeed because the people were prepared. And in the booths, later, the owner of the newspaper was told by a local policeman from the south who said, I have to tell you that the plan was we had dead bodies in the car and we were going to plant these dead bodies and say that these were Al-Qaeda people that we shot. Who would care? Who, who cares who they were? Except those who want to believe it. And this uprising in the Yemen now, which is spread to the north, the West is carrying on backing this guy. He's still being backed. They won't let Go, go, let him go, because they are worried that a democratically elected Yemeni government might go a different way. In Bahrain, same thing happened. Young people demonstrating in the squares, very, it's one of the most <coughs> joyful revolts, and young people linking arms, embracing each other, and saying there's no sectarianism. The big slogan in the squares of Bahrain was, neither Shia nor Sunni, we are Bahrainis, we are Bahrainis. It's like during the Thirty Years' War in Europe, if someone had said, neither Catholic nor Protestant, we are Europeans, we are Europeans, which no one did. <laughs> So, who sectarianized the struggle? The Saudis. Why did the Saudis come in? Because the Americans couldn't intervene themselves. And so Bahrain, the uprising has been crushed. And then we have this disaster in Libya. Now, as you probably gathered, I'm no friend of these despots who rule the countries like that, wherever they happen to be. I was never, never sympathetic to uh, Gaddafi. But the people who were sympathetic to him are the people who have been bombing him for six months. The United States, first and foremost, after, soon after 9-11, uh, Condoleezza Rice said in public that Muammar Gaddafi is a model Arab leader. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> the British government sent their Prime Minister, Tony Blair, to embrace him in public. And his press secretary, who has written his memoirs recently, said on the way to Tripoli with Tony Blair, with TB as he calls it, and TB asks me, how does Gaddafi maintain his rule over that country? And someone says, some foreign office guy says, through fear. And Tony Blair says to his press secretary, 
oh, that sounds good, can't be all bad then. Because he had himself created an atmosphere of fear on a different level in Britain to go to war in Iraq. He knew what this guy was talking about. So what did they do? They mended their fences. Tony Blair's leading academic hack, who some of you might have heard of, Anthony Giddens. Any of you heard of him now? A few, good. Soon you'll forget it. <laughs> <coughs> Anthony Giddens is sent to Libya. He meets Gaddafi. Gaddafi shows him this pile of gibberish, which is known as the Little Green Book, which is incoherent ramblings of Gaddafi. And Anthony Giddens reads this book and gives a press conference and writes and says, this is very similar to my own work and especially the third way that we are devising in Britain under Tony Blair and New Labour. Then the Libyans give a lot of money to the London School of Economics, in return for which Gaddafi's son is enrolled as a student. Top academics help to write his PhD dissertation. The PhD dissertation is inspected by other top academics, including Anne-Marie Slaughter, currently an advisor to uh, Barack Obama. And hey presto, Saif Gaddafi becomes a doctor. <coughs> All for money. And then they have the nerve now to say that they are trying to help the people of Libya against a despot, which is nothing to do with the reasons for the Western intervention. There are two reasons, primarily economic and partially ideological. Economic, the British Deputy Prime Minister said, we're taking Libya, we're, we're, we, we, we're intervening in Libya because our economic interests are involved i.e. we want to grab Libyan oil. The ideological reason is to show that having been caught off guard by these uprisings, we are now helping the people. So it's the combination that is being used in Libya. And it's not over. I mean, Gaddafi may be over, but the situation in Libya is not over. Who is going to rule Libya? after NATO's six months of bombing. That is the balance sheet. So we have two sides of the world in change. First, the ordinary people fighting, struggling. And that actually, I, I've been arguing this, that I think that the uprisings in the Arab world for democracy or liberty, equality, fraternity in the Arab world have changed perceptions marginally in the West about this world. I think there has been a partial decline in the huge wave of Islamophobia that gripped the West, encouraged from above, after 9-11. Because people now see with their own eyes what is happening in that world. But the question is, to what extent will this become a permanent shift? And what will be the role of the West? We live in a world where people have forgotten. The new generations have only vague memories of, and that's through university education, if that, that Europe once conquered and ruled large parts of the world. It was known as imperialism and colonialism. Large tracts of the world were owned by Europe, till an anti-colonial movement was born and won support in Europe too from progressive people and trade unions, some social democrats, communists who said no, we should get out of this world. And in recent years it's become fashionable again with new arguments to argue for forms of recolonization. Might is right because we're in favor of human rights. Or so it is said. Well, the balance sheet doesn't show any particular defense of human rights in most of the Arab world. But this is the new formula that has been used to justify wars and justify the United States in particular and its Western allies getting its own way. And I think the fact that this is not understood by European citizens is a problem. It is a real problem. 
And in that sense, one has to say that European, the, the sh I hope it's changing now. I have a feeling it's changing because of the economic crisis in large parts of Europe, where people, young people, are beginning to question the system that is now consigning them to paying huge amounts if they want anything. Education, health, etc. It hasn't reached that level in Scandinavia yet, I know. But large swathes of Europe are affected by this new turn, as you can see in Greece, in Spain, in Italy, in Ireland, in Iceland, even in this region. So that is creating a new awareness which is positive. And people are now questioning their leaders. But the system that has been created over the last 20 to 25 years of encouraging people to get into debt, borrow money, encouraging consumerism, encouraging people to believe that Western civilization is somehow superior to everything else. This is quite a common argument one hears. And it's not challenged and creating a political model in which virtually no alternatives are permitted. Unless you support the basic core of how this neoliberal economic system functions, you regard it as something extreme. People who today talk about the social democratic programs of social democratic parties after the Second World War are told they're crazy. We can't have that again, but that is what is needed, if not even more, to deal with this crisis. So you have a center-left and a center-right formations. The extreme center, a friend of mine calls it, which basically rules Europe and the United States. And here I come to Obama, about whom I've written quite a you know, polemical and angry book. Not against him as a person, I'm not interested in him, in, in him as a person, but as president of the Imperial Republic, the only empire in today's world. And my criticisms of him essentially are as follows, that he has continued with the policies of the previous administration, that nothing has shifted globally or internally in the United States of America, that on civil liberties, in, you know, some argue, some liberal commentators argue, he's even worse than Bush. He promised he would close down Guantanamo. He's kept it going. And in fact, Bush released more prisoners from Guantanamo than uh, Obama has done. In terms of justifying the continuation of a policy of renditions that carries on, in terms of drone attacks, think about it, drone attacks, which when they were carried out by the Third Reich in the closing days of the Second World War, the V-2 rockets, the whole Western world, the Allies were saying, this is unacceptable, these rockets which are, can hit anywhere, destroy property. Now, of course, the difference is, we're told, they are targeted. But you try telling that to anyone in Pakistan, that they are targeted. Several hundreds of innocents have been killed by these drone attacks. Women and children have been killed. And Obama, in his first year and a half in office, carried out more, authorized more drone attacks than Bush in the preceding five years. These are the facts. They're not denied by anyone. And what they reveal is something which we should understand, that we live in a culture, a political culture, a culture in which celebritism, to be a celebrity, is an incredibly important thing. If you look at the papers, you look at the television shows, you look at the reality television programs, everyone wants to be a celebrity and is encouraged to be that. Individualism of the worst sort, in my opinion, that's all encouraged, and politicians increasingly behave like that. So if a politician is not at the same time also good on television, then he or she is a failure. And the way many people looked at Obama was as a celebrity guy. He was much prettier than Bush. On that we can agree. <laughs> 
he spoke better, he had a better PR operation, he seemed inspirational. For me, that's not important. It's, you know, symbolically to have a, elected a mixed race president and put him in the White House is fine, but the symbolism is over now. It's done. You now have to judge people, not on the basis of who they are. Black, white, green, yellow, male, female, transsexuals. That can't be the criteria, identity of judging a political leader. The criteria has to be what this political leader does. What are the actions? That's how you always judge people, not by what they say, but by what they do. And on that, it's been a disaster. And when I wrote this book on Obama in 2010, many of my American liberal friends were very angry. Oh, it's too quick. Why are you saying this? All our I said, your illusions are being betrayed, nothing else. He never promised that much. On civil liberties he did, and he's betrayed. On everything else, most of the things he's doing. No serious regulation of Wall Street, after, even after the Wall Street crash of 2008. And the contradictions of this system are now there. If you want to, you can look at them. The entire philosophy of neoliberalism has been that the state must no longer be allowed to intervene to help the less well-off. They have to fend for themselves. The social welfare state that was you know, considered inviolable after the Second World War is now up for grabs. Privatization of the most hallowed domains of social provision are going on in most parts of Europe and, of course, the United States. The insurance and pharmaceutical companies in the United States wield such enormous lobbying power that their hold on the health service cannot be challenged. And it's no good saying the Republicans veto this, because for the first year Obama had a majority in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. If there was any time things could have been pushed through, it was then, and he didn't do it. And the reason he didn't do it is not because he was trapped, he didn't want to do it. And Iraq, withdrawal from Iraq, did you read what General Petraeus said a month ago? He's now head of the CIA. He said we will be in Iraq for a long time to come. This is a war that is not going to finish quickly, either there or elsewhere. And we will still be fighting these or similar wars when my children are grown up. That was the new strategy he announced. Now, I hope he's wrong, and probably he's talking out of turn, because how long the United States can wage wars depends on those countries where wars are being waged. I mean, in Afghanistan, where your troops are involved. The war has been going on for 10 years. Last week, the insurgents, the partisans, the resistance, fought a 20-hour battle in the center of Kabul, where the American embassy was under attack. A few days later, they, and the NATO headquarters, a few days later, they attacked the diplomatic quarter. And still, you have the Secretary General of NATO, this idiotic dame called Rasmussen, saying the war's going very well. <laughs> what? The war's going very well? No serious intelligence expert will say that to you. In fact, what they are saying more and more publicly is that this war cannot be won. We can't win it. Which is why, over the last five years, the United States and Britain have been negotiating with the resistance and saying, why don't you join the government? <coughs> and they are saying, we are happy to be part of a national government, but not while foreign troops are in our country. That we will not accept, because that means you will control the new government and not the, it, it, this country, and we are not going to accept that. That is now the dividing point. But think about it. First, the Russians invaded Afghanistan, and that was bad. I oppose that too, by the way. It was bad. Everyone accepted it was bad. The West organized a boycott of the Moscow Olympics as a result of that. Why? Because Russia had invaded a country against its will. 
10 years devastation on that country. Though to be fair, in some areas the Russians did better things than NATO. They did try and educate the people, in, even in villages setting up schools, educating women, all that they did. But despite that, the Afghans didn't like being occupied. And they were booted out. Then you had four years of civil war, where all these factions who had been fighting the Russians turned on themselves. And the Russians warned the Pakistanis after we are going to withdraw. Have no doubt about it. But after we withdraw, these guys are going to be fighting each other for territory. And it's much better if you set up a national government, including X, Y, Z, A, B, C, they gave names. If you don't do it, there will never be peace here in this country. But now we are going bye-bye. And the Pakistani government did consider this proposal. It was vetoed by the United States. It said, no, no, nothing to do with the power that's leaving or the people they're leaving behind. We build something new. <coughs> now you've had a NATO intervention for 10 years. So 25 years of war in that country. Longer than the First World War, longer than the Second World War. Just imagine what that does to the psychology of a people. The traumas, children being born in war-torn conditions. And yet European citizens happily sleepwalk from one war into another. They never used to do it during the Cold War. They never did it. There were huge peace movements all over Europe, including in Germany, including in Scandinavia, and in France, and in Britain, despite the fact that their countries in that period weren't even involved in the wars. But now it's fine. And side by side with that, the use of 9-11, the combination of that with Islamophobia has meant actually that laws of exception put into practice in the United States that anyone can be arrested and held without trial indefinitely are applied in most parts of Europe. You have tiny European countries mimicking the United States, setting up SWAT teams, soon they'll call them Navy SEALs, bursting into people's homes without any real evidence at all, dragging people out, frightening their wives and children, dragging the guys away, then releasing them because there's no evidence and, oh, we made a mistake, we might have misheard, the Arabic interpretation was wrong. This is happening all over Europe. In Britain, you have people who've been locked up for 11 years without a trial. No evidence at all. So what is the due process of law? Either it applies to everyone, or it's something that becomes debased, completely debased. So it's not just that these wars are being fought abroad. These wars are actually damaging the social and legal fabric of Europe itself. And the extremist center is the people who are behind it. And the citizens, so far, apart from the odd voices, have not resisted. And that is dangerous. It is dangerous because this sort of atmosphere encourages a poisonous hatred, which we've seen before in the 20s and 30s and 40s. The propaganda that was used and made against the Jews of Europe was horrific. We just think about the Holocaust, the Judeocide, which of course is an atrocious crime. But people forget the decades or even the centuries preceding it in which casual anti-Semitism was not abnormal in many parts of Europe. It was there. And what is the point of educating people about all that today when the same sort of things are being said about another religious minority, Muslims, in Europe? <coughs> Virtually the same, sometimes word by word, the propaganda that is used against them. They are not like us, nor the Jews. 
And the same thing was said about the Jews. They had a different Sabbath. They wear funny things on their head. They have their own dietary arrangements. They speak their own language, which we can't understand. All this was said against the Jews. And people took it. And so the huge rise of fascism in Germany didn't come as a total surprise to many people, that they could mobilize popular support. I say this not because we have the threat of fascism now. Don't get me wrong. There isn't that threat. What we are faced with is something far more insidious, because that was very open and public, of what people say to each other in private, of what people are prepared to tolerate. And this big change in the atmosphere in Europe, which has been going on for about two or three decades, is producing now far-right organizations who are winning electoral representation. Why shouldn't they? If people agree with them, they'll vote for them. Better that they do it in the open rather than go around killing people. But it's happening. And it has to be taken seriously. And the people responsible for that are not the minorities or the refugees or the immigrants. The people responsible for that are the people who have created a, a social, economic, and political system backed ideologically by the bulk of the media, which sees that there's no alternatives. That is creating the problems in large parts of Europe. I mean, France recently, or some uh, last year, actually put large numbers of gypsies, traveling people on a plane, and sent them out of the country. In Naples, three years ago, they set gypsies on fire. This is happening in Europe under the EU. And these things will carry on as long as people are in search of scapegoats and refuse to look at what the real problems are. And here the Arab uprisings offer some hope largely led by young people. In Tunisia, actually, the one thing that that government, which has now been toppled, did to was it educated its people. Gaddafi never did that. In Egypt, it was very uneven. But in Tunisia, a large bulk of the population was educated. And when unemployment hit them, they thought that it would never happen. That created the explosion. And it was very noticeable who was leading that, that, that struggle. But they came out and did it. And recently, in Greece and in Spain, you had, again, young people in the forefront of the huge mobilizations against the austerity measures and the governments using the crisis in a way that the rich benefit and the poor suffer. That is what is going on. And the European Union itself is now in a very deep crisis. <laughs> So here I end with a plea to all of you and your generation. Think critically. I'm not saying you should agree with me, but for God's sake, think and read. Because what is happening in this continent is going to get worse. It's not going to get better if these bunch of politicians, and this includes most parts of Europe, are roughly the same. There is less debate and discussion now in the media and on television networks, critical discussion than there was during the Cold War. And support for war and the shrinking and hollowing out of democracy are the two processes which are related to each other. Have no doubt about that. And you're the generation which is going to live the next 30 years in this continent, on this continent. And you have to see and look. How is the situation going to be changed? Because if it isn't, then we're all in trouble. Thank you. this way. I will search the crowd, just uh, try to find eye contact with me and I will nod. If I have not, you will be able to ask me something. Yeah. We'll stop now.
months to plan for new rules, but I for one need to stay optimistic. So I was wondering, do you think it's possible for the US to make change? And in that case, what is necessary in order to make that change politically? Did you hear that question at the back? Yeah. Um, the question essentially was, uh, the young woman in the front said that she wants to stay optimistic, which I agree with, by the way, even though the world is in a bad way, and ask that, is there any way I think that the United States can change uh, at the present time, and if so, how? <coughs> Accurate? Okay. Uh, look, I probably visit the United States more than any European country, at least twice or three times a year. And I talk to young people and old people, and a lot of them are desperate for change. I mean, let's not forget that in the United States, there was a huge attempt by American citizens to stop the Iraq war from happening. We just remember Europe. But in New York, the city hit by terrorists, half a million people, more than half a million people marched against the Iraq war, three quarters of a million people in the Bay Area, in state capitals like uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities, 70,000 people came out. They told me we have never seen such a huge demonstration here. And all over the states, you, it was just... So it's not that Americans are any different. I don't like this attitude which some people adopt of Americans are stupid. You know, I mean, there's stupid people everywhere, for God's sake. The Americans don't have a monopoly of that. Uh, American, ordinary American people are just like anyone else. They don't like these things. And they're too suffering from politics in a way that we are in, in, in Europe. Nothing changes. Clinton, Bush, Bush, Obama, Obama, God knows who. Now, in my opinion, what the United States needs, and there are huge discussions going on, is to break this gridlock where these two parties, more or less believing in the same thing or their leaderships, have held power for such a long time without any third party emerging in that country. And the system as such militates against a third party or political movement emerging. The way it's structured and it's huge. So debates are going on permanently as to what we are going to do. And when the will is there, by large numbers of people, something will emerge. And maybe sooner than we think. Because I think the Obama experience, which galvanized large numbers of young people, I mean, it was amazing to view that. I was in the States for quite a lot of that campaign. It was fantastic. Young people who had not been engaged in politics at all, galvanized by the thought that change was about to come. They're the ones who are most disappointed. Not the old lags who knew, but the young. And... <clears throat> I, I say to them very openly, I said, no point in getting too depressed about it. And I never said it to you at the time, and I'm not going to say I told you so. It's boring. But we're not that surprised the way the system dominates its politicians. And we need new ways of challenging the system. And there are examples in parts of South America, which you don't look at because you think it's very different. But here you have the rise of social movements which have created political organizations, which have come to power and started implementing a program of reforms which they promised people. It's not earth-shaking, but it's extremely important for those countries. In countries like Venezuela, and Bolivia, and Ecuador, you now have free education, universities being built, oil wealth being used to build hospitals, doctors being trained. It's important. So there are examples of this in other parts of the world. But when, you know, I can't, we can't determine when this will happen in the United States, but I, we need it to happen, because that is the only way some change will happen elsewhere too. And it's not just we who know that, it's the rulers of that country who know that as well.
that with the glasses. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, two questions, but you can choose with which one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> However, I, mean, I think, for example, these governments in uh, the Middle East, uh, can it be argued that they are uh, something that we inherited uh, after the Cold War? I mean, that the governments that were put in, for example, in Iran, for example, is an uh, aftershakes after the Cold War. Uh, and I mean, and also China. Uh, ah, well, what can you about that? look, the Middle Eastern governments, after it, it was after the Cold War and after the big turn to neoliberalism mm -hmm. that these governments in the Middle East went with the new Washington consensus and impose neoliberal policies. There's a whole pattern of it. <coughs> Imposing neoliberalism under democracy is bad enough. Imposing it with dictatorships creates real anger, because at least in a democratic country, you can stand up and say, this is bad. Not that that changes anything, but at least you can say it and uh, try and organize against it. In a dictatorship, you, you can't, you're not even allowed to say it's wrong. So it's not that the U.S. inherited it. They took these people and remounted them. Hosni Mubarak, Ben Ali, all these people were done by that. They did deals with the Assad family. And look at what I regard as one of the more pernicious states in existence, Saudi Arabia. That predates the Cold War. The Saudi Arabian uh, tribe that the British favored, the Sauds, not by any means, the majority tribe in Saudi Arabia. The British favored them, fought with them, armed them, and gave them a country. And then that country discovered oil, and then you know there were celebrations in every Western capital. And if you want to read about Saudi Arabia, I would recommend the novels of Abdul Rahman Munif, M-U-N-I-F. He's dead now, died recently, a Saudi novelist the most amazing set of novels about that country called Cities of Salt, in which you get a real picture of Saudi Arabia. And when the British Empire was on the decline, even during the Second World War, Roosevelt said, OK, we'll take up the Saudi franchise. And seamlessly, Saudi Arabia was transferred from the British to the United States, who have kept it going uh, uh, ever since. And they will fight to the death to protect it as well, unless they're completely taken by surprise. China. Well, what China shows is that capitalism functions best without any democracy at all. Think about it. No trade unions, no people fighting to improve. They are, but you know, no official backing for people fighting their rights. Everything decided from the top. And you have the world's most dynamic capitalist economy, the workshop of the world. You wander around the streets of your city today into the shops, just, you know, as a little I do this from now, seeing where things were made. The number of things reading made in China is quite astonishing. It's the same here as it is if you go to Bolivia, into market towns. Where in the old days you just traditional markets. I remember three years ago in Bolivia buying some beautiful plates from a native indigenous people's market in Cochabamba. And when I got home to put them in my case, I turned around made in China. So this is the workshop of the world. Everything is produced there. And it has been a huge boost to capitalist economy. Leading, you know, the, the United States is hugely in debt to China. Which is why Admiral Mike McMullen, the retiring uh, 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 boss of the Joint Chiefs in the United States, in his farewell speech, he said, I think the biggest security threat to our country is the fact that we are in debt to the tune of so many trillion dollars, the worst debt we have ever had in our entire history. Now, when there is a real threat posed by an American general, their response normally is to go and bomb it. But he didn't suggest bombing Wall Street. 
which has got them into this debt. And of course, they might dream of it, but they can never destroy the Chinese either. I mean, China is not a weak country. It is not an imperial power, but it has got enough to defend itself. So the options of cantonizing or balkanizing China aren't serious options at all. This is the story, the narrative, which you, many of you will live through for the next 60, 70 years. What is going to happen in the 21st century? Will the United States preserve its hegemony? And will the Chinese <coughs> always stand by the self-denying ordinance that they are not interested to be a world power? And on this, we'll, you know, that's the pivot on which this century is, uh, is going to turn. There's a lot more to say about China, honestly, and I study it non-stop, but I can't give it to you now. The woman with a scar? Well, you've obviously not been listening to a word I've said. <laughs> I don't blame you. I sometimes do send people to sleep. Uh, but my book will answer that for you, I promise you. And uh, the, I, I, essentially, my view of the Obama administration is that it is continuing in the policies of its predecessor, so much so that Bush himself has praised Obama as being a very worthy successor to him. What more can I say? Uh, and then we had this episode which created a lot of buzz for a few days on the television networks and the video sphere, which was the targeting and killing of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. Now, there are a few things to be said about that. If you look at the releases of the American leaders watching the Navy SEALs carrying out this action, they were watching it, you know, live, like a, a, a sport. And he's killed, and they celebrate, and they're joyous. But just think about that. That shouldn't the West, which says it is civilizationally superior, behave like that? There was no resistance. Why was he captured, taken alive, brought back, and tried in a court of law? Why? If you justify a powerful country behaving like a terrorist organization, what moral right do you have to say to the terrorists, don't behave like this? Only we can behave like this, not you. And what created a real tension in the Islamic world? No one's, very few people support Osama bin Laden. It's obvious. Everyone knows that. But what stunned people in the world of Islam was that his body was not given over to his family for burial. His sons, who said publicly, we never agreed with our dad, he's wrong, <coughs> but please give us the body to bury. That is our right. And this has nothing to do with Islam, by the way. This goes back a long time in history. I mean, some of you may have read or seen the play Antigone by Sophocles being performed. What is that play about? About the burial of a body. When the king decrees that a body cannot be published, uh, uh, buried because he was a rebel who betrayed us, the sister buries the body and is punished. Antigone. This goes back to ancient Greece. We'll go back even beyond that. Homer's <coughs> Iliad, when Achilles kills Hector, there's one of the most moving passages in the Iliad, is the old king of Troy, Priam, coming a broken man that his son has been killed and falls on his knees before Achilles and says, at least return the body. And Achilles orders his people because the body is very brutally injured, clean it, wash it, and give it to the father as if it were pure and fresh. 
So even in ancient times, these things were done. But not today. And Europe accepted it. All the European leaders said, wonderful, great. The world will be a safer place. I mean, that was the most idiotic thing to say, <laughs> that the world will be a safer place. And I, I say this to you just to think about what has happened, that this can take place just like that, targeting, killing. Of course, the Israelis do it all the time, but people attack them for it, saying, don't do it. Target individuals and kill them. But for the United States to do it in this shape and fashion and for Europe to support it is a sign of debasement. So, you know, and many, many other things we can go on about in relation to Obama. I joked at the time that the way it's set up and we're seeing the news, I'm sure Catherine Bigelow is going to make a movie. I said it the same day in public. But you can't, satire is impossible these days, because now it has been announced that Catherine Bigelow is making a movie. <laughs> and uh, it's going to be shown or released next fall, just in time for the re-election campaign. Good. Yeah. Why didn't Obama do what he said he would do? That is, you say you should judge politicians from uh, what they actually do, but uh, to my understanding, Obama said he would do lots of things that we all agree would be good things, but he didn't do them. Why didn't he do it? But why are we surprised when politicians promise things to get into <laughs> power, and when they come into power, they don't do them? It's not a new phenomenon. And why should Obama be any different from any other politician? But that is where, this is exactly a sign of European sentimentality, really, that because he was Obama. I mean, he was a democratic politician, bred in the Chicago machine of politics, one of the worst machines in American politics today, ruthless, brutal. You don't get promoted by that machine unless you're a machine politician. He was an intelligent man, is, but he was essentially a machine politician and was seen as such by many other African-American Democrats who were his colleagues in Illinois. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the evidence is there. So he didn't do it because he didn't regard it as a priority when he came to power. Why did he say that he would do things that he knew he wouldn't do? Well, you know, at a time when you're fighting an election, you have to say some things to differentiate you from your opponent. Even in the United States, yes, Clinton used to say similar things when he fought the campaign against Bush. I mean, honestly, it's no good attacking me for that. I mean, it's your illusions in Obama which have failed you. And you have to answer, why did you think that he was different from any other politician? Because he had a black face? Well, millions of people thought he would be different. I'm afraid, you know, people sometimes think things about politics which very rapidly turn out not to be true. And in the United States today, from his own supporters, there's much, much more criticism of him than there is in Europe. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so to pretend, you know, the logic of your question, I can see where it's leading. That Obama is basically a good guy, but American politics is such that he's a prisoner of the system. He always was a prisoner of the system. I heard him. Okay, sorry, you want to interrupt. Yeah. Can I put one single question? Sure. Uh, in today's U.S. political scene, you have two things. This is un-American. Sorry? Un-American. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, un-American. Yes, un-American. Is that to your, to your uh, uh, conviction a way of being a typical American? Because uh, the Republicans today, they, they attack uh, Obama to being un-American. You see what I mean? No. no. <laughs> what, what, I, what I have to say is, is that a more, more um, deeper uh, American attitude 
which doesn't change from president to president. So there is things he has to say when he goes to his elections, but for instance, for vetoes, vetoes, uh, there is a grounded conviction in the states how they behave to Israel. <coughs> uh, even if he knew he could turn to Europe in certain cases, and he could do things which, which uh, uh, separated from, from the history. Uh, when it comes to the point, there is a, you have to be a typical American. Yeah, this is true. What you, you know, I agree with you that it's a huge systemic uh, problem and that no American president, unless there are exceptional conditions, uh, will break with the system. But Obama never even promised any serious breaks. On Israel and Palestine, before the election, he said that Jerusalem should be the permanent capital of Israel, which no other American president had said before, not even George W. Bush, in a meeting before AIPAC. This was before he was elected. So he went on his knees, essentially, before the huge Israel lobby in AIPAC. And not all American Jews agree with that, because there are people who are very angry with being represented by AIPAC. So he could have appealed to them. But he didn't do it because this has become a you know a key problem uh, uh, in the United States, and that's all true. But you know the on the, the more serious problem is that can the American? It's a question asked by the young woman here. As can the American system, as constituted at present, offer change of any meaningful sort, even within the system? We don't talk about anything else. I think it's very difficult, as I think it's very difficult in Europe. I mean, you've had a huge crisis in Europe. Which politician is saying we should break with neoliberal policies totally and reinvent how we function and what the state does and what the state doesn't do? So one can't just blame the Americans, which I never do. I don't think Europe is any better, by the way. view on the threat from the Islamic Republic of Iran. I think the biggest threat of the Islamic Republic is to its own people. I don't think it threatens anyone else. And I think <clears throat> if you talk to American policymakers, they know this full well. Because without the support of Iran, there is no way the United States could have taken either Iraq or Afghanistan. <coughs> the Islamic Republic supported that war. They gave the green light for it. They said that their people wouldn't resist the Americans. So they've been extremely helpful. And the reason for that is simple. That Saddam was their enemy and the Taliban were their enemy. And so temporarily the enemy of their enemies was their friend. And that was very convenient and useful for the United States. And if Obama had been clever, he would have ditched caution like Nixon did when he flew to Beijing and gone and done a deal with the Iranian government. The biggest opposition to that came from the Israelis, who are fearful that the Iranians will acquire a nuclear capacity. But here we have to have a sense of balance. Iran, any Iranian government, not just the clerics, Iran is surrounded by nuclear powers. Israel in the Middle East, the only nuclear power. Pakistan, right next to it. India, China, American nuclear missiles carried in U.S. submarines constantly in those waters. Iran has lost planes fired on by non-nuclear missiles. So it's not a total surprise that they feel the only way to protect themselves for eternity is to have nuclear weapons. Many countries take that. But that doesn't mean that they are going to use them. I mean, who is the only country that's used nuclear weapons? As you know, is the United States at the tail end of the Second World War. In Japan, no one has used <laughs> nuclear weapons. It may happen, but 
people who use them know what's going to happen. Armageddon. So I think the irrationality towards uh, the Iranian regime is not explicable except in the context of the Israeli-US uh, alliance. That's what uh, keeps it going. And it doesn't do the people of Iran any good either. Because the clerics then use this to say, look, we are being threatened from abroad. How can we allow this, that, and the other? Tomorrow we are going to face attacks, etc. So it's not good for either country. Uh, but essentially, I mean, in terms of Iran itself, by handing power to the clerical Shia parties in Iraq, the United States has made Iran the dominant player in that region, which has upset even the Saudis, their closest allies. So it's a very contradictory world we live in. But I will say this thing about, I will say one thing about Iran, which I was discussing with friends earlier today, that in many ways it is the most vibrant country in terms of culture. And it really is. If you see the level of some of the literature that's being produced, poetry that's being produced in Iranian cinema, which is probably the finest cinema in the world today, much, much better than anything that's being done in, in Hollywood or the United States. I mean, they have taken and the art of cinema and taken it to a higher plane. And the bulk of the people in Iran are under 30 years of age. So it's a young country, and I'm very optimistic <laughs> about it. I think that you know people sometimes say, where will the big Islamic reformation come? Don't be surprised if it comes from Iran. But in order for that to happen, the absurdity surrounding Iran, threat, Iran is a threat, destroy Iran. Uh, Dick Cheney just published his memoirs, which unfortunately some of us have to read. <laughs> but one interesting thing in which he says, that he was in favor after the Iraq war of bombing Iran and Bush vetoed it. You can think about that later at night. Thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, you started your lecture by calling the importance of remembering and how the fact that the history actually neutralized the society in the West and the mobilization of the masses is actually kind of impossible here. And given the fact that right now in the Europe, and we can actually find in the USA as well, there is this rise of the populist right wing parties. Do you think the answer for the left to answer this situation, or the, the only way that the left has to actually mobilize masses again in a way, because they forget the history, is revolt is actually going back to the kind of making the left wing kind of populism party, because you mentioned the Latin America. Does this is this the only way that left have, and also I have a quick question about the Palestinian bid. I guess it would be relevant that we did it today. Uh, given that already implied no by the U.S. that it comes to the Security Council, we are going to veto the Palestinian bid on the... Sorry, speak up. Uh, I'm talking about the Palestinian bid right now yeah. in the U.N. I'm saying that given the implied no by the U.S. at the moment, do you think, what, what, what do you see this action? Is it only kind of making a dissensus or showing the hypocrisy of the British machinery? <coughs> well, look, on the first question, as I said earlier, I don't want to repeat myself too much. Uh, we have a huge rise of right-wing populist groups, semi-fascist groups in Europe. But it's not the only thing. You have a huge mass mobilization of young people in Spain, in Greece, in Britain, against the policies that government is, is imposing. And huge mobilizations against the right, too. So it's not you know, just one, one thing. We have to see that, and that's very important. And of course, the young people who are marching in Spain, they banned the, the government party and its trade unions from coming to the Puerto del Sol in Madrid because they said, we hold you responsible. And they are right. Because the official left everywhere in Europe, whether communist or social democratic, has degenerated beyond belief. There's no difference between them and the, the centre-right parties. Hardly any difference at all. A few sometimes on cultural issues in Spain, where you have, on a cultural level, the Spain of Pedro Almodovar and the Spain of the Catholic Church. And fine, on that we support Almodovar. But on political economic issues, 
what do I do there? So these young people, you know, in their hundreds of thousands said, no, we don't want the trade unions to come because you accepted these austerity measures. They are now destroying our country. But the, di the difficulty there is that they don't automatically have a political party or a political organization to which they want to go to, and in many cases they don't even want to create one because they feel politics has become so tainted and filthy by money, war, permanent compromises. That's wrong in my opinion. My advice, you know, when I was in Madrid was to say, you have to create something. It's what I was saying, you have to create third parties. They shouldn't be bureaucratic parties run from the top, but they have to, you have to create, because to lose the concept of the political at this time in world politics is just very, very misguided. On Palestine, I'm, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that the United States is going to veto. I mean, that's the least surprising thing about the current events. The question which is really important is this. Let's say the Security Council recognized Palestinian independence. What does it mean concretely? I mean, the PLO is hated by large chunks of the Palestinian population because of their degree of corruption after the Oslo Accords. They behaved like an, you know, they were treated like an NGO and they behaved like one. All important was money, 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 money. And the top leaders of the PLO built huge homes for themselves on tops of hills while the ordinary Palestinians were impoverished, which is why people voted for Hamas. And then the EU and the United States refused to recognize the election of Hamas because democracy had gone the wrong way. And now we have a situation where the only, there are only two possibilities, in my opinion. Either the Israelis really retreat to the 67 frontiers, and then there's a chance of some viable Palestinian state. But there are so many settlers now on the occupied lands that which Israeli government is going to send in the army to remove the settlers? Because that's what they would have to do, because these guys, many of them, are crazy and will fight, including against their own army, if they have to. I can't see any Israeli government doing that. And if they don't do that, what is the point of a Palestinian state? It's just a bunch of disjointed Bantustans you know, permanently overlooked by Israeli armor. What will that get them? Nothing. Well, many of us are arguing now, and have been since the Oslo course, that the only meaningful solution, even if it takes a century, ultimately, for the people of that area, is for Jews and Muslims and Christians, and all three communities exist, to exist in one state. There's no other way in the long term. And many people are now coming up to say this. And that you can fight for from outside as well for such a goal, even though it's a long-term goal. And I was asked once by a Hamas person, soon after they came to power, OK, you're very critical of the PLO. We accept that, but you've made criticisms. Well, what would you do in our place? I said, on this I can answer. Many times I'm asked that. What would you do if you're president of the United States? And it's a stupid question, so I don't answer it. But I said, in this case, I will answer it. it. What I would do is dissolve the Palestinian Authority, because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as a Palestinian Authority. It is essentially dominated by the Israeli Defense Force, the Israeli army. Just recognize reality and say to the world, there is no Palestinian Authority. We are the representatives of the Palestinians, but we have no power at all. We are under sanctions, under siege, bombed at will. So we are just here, and we will live as citizens of the world, or this particular entity, and now we leave it to you. We are just going to be with ourselves. He couldn't have blown. And I said, if you don't do that, you will fall into the same trap as the PLO. Totally disagree. 